I want to thank everybody again for joining our beach nesting bird volunteer training. Um, this is the uh, nine o'clock to 10 o'clock training for returning volunteers. So um, we know that you guys uh, know this information well, um, but we thank you for, for joining just to get a little bit of a refresher um, before we dive into the, the 2022 season. Um, the birds are already arriving and, um, you know, we're all excited to get out there and, and see what uh, plovers, oyster catchers and terns are, are turning up at the various beaches. Um, if you haven't already, if you could put your name in the chat um, so we can keep an attendance list, that would be great. Uh, also, if you have questions during the presentation, if you want to go ahead and put those in the chat, um, you know, those of us who aren't speaking will we'll try to answer them. Um, or if you want to wait until the end of the presentation, we'll take more questions then. Um, we have uh, on the call today, um, myself, uh, Corey Polson keith the Director of Bird Conservation for Audubon, Connecticut. Uh, we have Laura Saucer, Saucier, um, a state biologist uh, from the DEP. Uh, Scott Kroybosch coming back as our volunteer coordinator for I think the 11th season. And uh, Martha Royce Rice, who will be coordinating volunteers at Griswold Point uh, in Old Lyme. And then we have uh, Kat Gillis, who's uh, one of our returning field staff, um, who is uh, central to uh, Milford Point. So, um, you know, just a reminder that the piping plover volunteer training is put on by the Audubon Alliance, which is a partnership between Audubon, Connecticut, the Kinetic Audubon Society, and the Nature Conservancy that um, assists the state of Connecticut with the stewardship and management of our beach nesting birds. Um, so with that, I'm um, just going to share the agenda for this morning's call. Hold on a second. I just got to try to figure out how to advance my slide here. There we go. Um, so uh, we've kind of done our welcome. And I'm going to turn it over to Laura, who's going to give a re refresher on our beach nesting birds. I'll talk briefly about reporting banded birds. Then uh, Scott will kind of give an update on scheduling and reporting. Um, we are hoping to have somebody from NCON join us to talk about being a good witness. Um, if there's somebody from NCON on the call, if you want to send me a, a message in the chat, uh, just let me know that to let me know you're here. That would be great. And then um, Scott will finish up with submitting paperwork and uh, picking up your lanyards and badges. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Laura. Laura, you're muted. After two years, you'd think I'd have this sorted out, but nope. So hopefully you can see my screen. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, so I know quite a few of you uh, attended our um, wrap-up session from 2021, but I figured for those who weren't able to make okay. it, I would just go over some of uh, the results from last year. And um, all right. So uh, last year um, was, as always, a challenging year. Some are more challenging than others, but um, this had challenging weather, um, lots of predation, um, interesting turn results, and uh, of course, the challenging humans. Um, I'm sure a lot of you realize uh, there was two storm events, um, in, one in May, one in June, that pretty much washed out like almost, you know, 15 nests uh, the first time. And then uh, those re-nests got washed out again in June. So that kind of um, messed with our productivity a bit. But um, I'm happy to say our productivity was pretty darn good, even with that. So last year we had 60 pairs, 60 breeding pairs, and we fledged 80 young with a productivity of 1.33 chicks produced per pair, which is, um, we use the number 1.2 chicks produced per pair as a, a static, when you have a static population, that's about the number of chicks you need to produce to keep your population stable. So we are just a little bit above that. So that was great. Uh, some of the pros that we had last year were um, most of the municipal fireworks didn't happen again. So that's always 
helpful for beach nesting birds. We had one new breeding site out, um, out east in East Lyme, um, Old Black Point. We had a pair show up, which uh, we've been checking that, or Rebecca has been checking that site out every year for years because it looks like pretty good habitat. And one pair finally showed up and had a nest. So that was great. Uh, we had rat predation at um, Long Beach, which was un unfortunate. Long Beach um, was problematic. And I'll show you in our next slide the results from that site. But um, rats and weasels are pretty much the only two things that can get into our exclosures, um, get through the exclosure without digging. And uh, so that was problematic at Long Beach. Uh, we had issues with ATVs at three sites. We had issues with drones flying over um, nesting pairs, which is problematic because they consider, you know, a drone is no different than a, than a gull flying over. Um, so it's definitely a disturbing activity for these birds. Uh, dogs, of course, kiteboarding, of course. Um, we had issues with uh, group uh, walks um, and also a kayak summer camp, which was hauling up on uh, Grizzled Point, which was problematic as well. Um, we had a least turn chick mortality event, which I'll talk about in a bit, and um, common turn mortality event during migration. Are my slides moving? No. Mm. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Uh, okay, so these were the, the site breakdown. Um, we had a pair show up at Campo Beach again last year, which is great. And uh, while they weren't successful, it's nice to see them at showing up at newer beaches. Long Beach, which I noted um, was disappointing with really um, poor productivity across the board. Uh, we had a pair at Short Beach, which did pretty well. Um, Milford Point Sandbar um, did pretty well with 11 pairs out there. That's pretty good. Um, Cedar Beach, which is the beach right next door to Milford Point, only had one pair. Sandy Point was really impressive with 15 pairs packed out there. And not only 15 pairs, but those 15 pairs had good success because when we've seen elevated like high numbers of pairs out when you see high numbers of pairs packed into one site you you tend to see a lot of uh fighting amongst the pairs and they because they're so busy defending territories sometimes they ignore their kids and the kids get picked off but this didn't seem to be the case this year so that's great grizzle point had two um mile creek and hatchets point both had one pair each that did great Old Black Point, our new site, did well. Harkness did pretty well. Uh, Bluff Point, eh. Uh, Mumford Cove did really well with 80% fledged success. That's great. And then we had one pair that was nesting out on Sandy Point Island in Stonington, which for those of you who don't know that island, it's a big island that is um, part of it's owned by Rhode Island and part of it is owned by Connecticut. And the, we own like a very small tip of that island and uh, that's where the pair nested last year so that was pretty good but you you might notice if you know these beaches that there's a bit of a, a trend here where the beaches that only have one pair seem to do so small beaches with one pair seem to do pretty well the uh, fledge success is much higher at those locations um, and I'm assuming that might be just predator um, concentration and perhaps just human disturbance at private beaches. Um, you know, there's less public uh, traversing of those habitats. So it's interesting. So this is our uh, breeding pairs. You know, we're still kind of on the up and up, which is great. So we have birds returning back, back to us. And then this is our productivity graph, which um, is interesting. So even though we have more pairs, our productivity is kind of stayed static. So that um, 
says to me that there are, you know, those outside influences like predation that are coming into coming into the equation, predation and human disturbance and that sort of thing. So um, again, the red is the number of pairs and the purple is the productivity. So um, you can see some, some years they're both in sync and some years they are, they are not. Okay, so um, least turn nesting. So um, least turn productivity is always pretty poor from what I can gather from all the data looking back to the 80s. Um, the productivity, even with higher numbers, um, the productivity still was not really all that great. And that seems to be, um, there was a, a meeting this past winter uh, where we talked about least turns from a, a regional perspective. And um, the consensus seems to be that while least turn productivity is pretty poor, for the most part, they are long lived species. So it is a, a bit of an evolutionary strategy that if you can live longer, you can withstand years of poor productivity. Um, so while these birds um, don't fare so well here in Connecticut, um, the number of birds on the regional, adult birds on the regional uh, scale um, has remained stable over the past, uh, at least the past 10 years. So um, while we, you might wanna wring your hands looking at these this productivity, I think it's it's um, it, it's all right. I'm going to cautiously say it's all right. Um, so last year at Sandy Point, we had um, least turn chicks getting picked off by likely a great horned owl, and then we also had a hatchling mortality event um, that coincided with uh, an extreme decline in the colony size within two weeks. Um, the ad the adults were seen bringing fish back to the chicks, appropriately sized fish as well, um, yet the birds were still dying. So, um, you know, food likely wasn't an issue, um, must be something else. So uh, we collected a couple of hatchlings and sent them to Yukon. We're still waiting on lab results. So really no, no news there, um, hoping we'll get something soon. So again, this is productivity over the past uh, 10 years or so for least turns. It's up, it's down. Um, again, these are pretty uh, pretty interesting birds. Uh, they move around a lot. So um, we've also noticed in our data that um, all our colonies tend to be smaller than they historically were. Um, and we have also noticed that um, we will get colonies forming late, like in July, which usually indicates that these birds failed somewhere else and then have moved to try and find a new place to, to nest. So, um, you know, they just, they're, they move around. Okay, so we had a common turn mortality event during migration last, uh, last August, September, and um, again, we're still waiting on results, but uh, thank you to those who collected carcasses for us. Um, we did submit those to uh, UConn for, um, for testing. There was some kind of initial results here, which um, they tested about half the samples at the time that I had gotten this information and um, the birds died of disseminated bacterial infections. Um, which basically caused blood poisoning. Um, so while the, the bacterial cultures were not consistent, the lesions with it on the organs of those birds seem to be. So um, it, it's at the time was still a bit of a mystery. I need to check back in with UConn to see if they um, have finished their, their testing. Um, thank you, really, truly. Um, this we cannot be as successful and for as long as we've been successful here in Connecticut without your help. So I really truly appreciate all the time and uh, communication that you um, do with us. It really, it makes a difference.
So I am going to hand this over to Scott to talk about um, data scheduling. And Corey interrupt me. Did I get the, the schedule wrong here? Or are we going into Scott? Are you talking about, um, are you doing your slides now? Sorry. I think it's, um, so it, did you put the banding slides at the, after this? I believe I did. Okay. Sorry. If I didn't switch it up. If Scott has to go next, I can talk about reporting banded birds after that. Thanks. Sorry. No problem. All right. So as Laura just said, thank you so much, everybody, for coming back. It really does mean a lot to us to get all of you, especially returning volunteers, consistently coming year after year, knowing exactly what we need, knowing your beaches, knowing your birds, how to interact with all the various people we meet on the beach. So we really appreciate that. And most of what I'm going to say right now, at least, is pretty much exactly the same as normal. We have a very similar setup for data collection, monitoring duties, responsibilities, um, and all that as, as always. So we basically know the drill here. All of you can let me know if you're gonna to return to your usual beach and your usual schedule. We just ask that, you know, everybody at least gets out to the beach about once a month for at least a few hours. You're going to be collecting data for our, our, four, our four focal species, piping plovers, least terns, common terns, and American oyster catchers. You know to report problems that you see, whether it's nest abandonment, predator problems, public things, stuff like string fencing and signs down to us as soon as possible, and then some of the larger issues that might be requiring more um, rapid response from us to directly tell all of us, including Laura and Rebecca and Deep on email, or if necessary, call local law enforcement. We're going to be educating beachgoers, especially now that we're in a slightly better place in the last couple of years. We want to make sure we can talk to people, you know, keeping in mind some basic, you know, hygiene and social distancing and, and masking if needed. And we're going to thankfully have opportunities to assist with uh, spring fencing, string fencing and event monitoring that uh, comes up through the year. So we'll get the string fencing dates to you soon. And we're very glad we can welcome everyone back with us for that. And I'm guessing this year, we're gonna have a lot more fireworks and that sort of thing going on too, that we might need your help for. You can next slide, please, Laura. Sorry, my computer's thinking. <laughs> okay, no problem. And all of you know the conduct very well, that we go to the beach with the intent to monitor and our behavior and our dress and appearance will reflect that. You will have to have a current liability waiver on file with DEEP, which we will provide for you in the form that we already have up in the blog in the right-hand column of important documents it includes the release of liability form, the information from DEEP on the monitoring program this year, how to be a good witness, dog information at various applicable beaches and municipalities, as well as the um, witness form itself. And you'll have the ID badge of monitoring, and I'll talk about that more a little later, but this year we're gonna have them available at a few locations to be picked up instead of you know meeting in person as we would usually for the meeting or mailing. And that we ask again, that you just basically be a professional do what you know we need to do in terms of monitoring birds rather than making it a beach day when we go monitor and to continue practicing safe and smart social distancing when monitoring. It's thinking again. I got you. It's good to have a moment. We all need to think. <laughs> And all of you know by now to bring the basic items with you, including binoculars or spotting scope. We will have brochures that can be picked up as well at locations where you can get your 
ID and badge and lanyard. You should have your phone, hopefully, along with something to write with if you want to write manually um, on a piece of paper instead of entering right away. And you should have all the basics that you need to keep yourself safe and good at the beach, including water and snacks or sunblock, good clothing for the various seasons and remembering that it's a lot colder usually at the shore than it is uh, inland, especially at the beginning of the season. Monitoring as usual will begin on April 1st officially. I know some of you have already gone to the beach and if you'd like to go beforehand, that's fine as well, especially all of you because you know exactly what to do. We want as many people as we can get for those weekends, those holidays, the warm beach weather when it gets really busy, especially when people are out there doing all those kind of crazy things that we talked about. Um, just sign up as usual. Most of you already have to RSVP for this and everything will go through ctwaterbirds at gmail.com as always. You can tell us your requested schedule of days, specific dates um, for what month, including AM or PM or specific time if possible. It's not necessary, but that helps if you have it. And if you can submit that within the next week, that will be fantastic. And if you need to change it again, as always, no problem. Just please let us know. And it's especially important if you have already scheduled for your monitoring session but cannot make it, please let us know beforehand if possible so that we know you're not going to be on the beach. The locations available include, as we mentioned, we have some birds now nesting at Compo Beach in Westport, which is great. We also have Sherwood Island State Park in Westport, Pleasure Beach, Long Beach, Russian Beach, Milford Point, Silver Sands, Sandy Point, Griswold Point and Bluff Point. And as you saw from the results from last year from Laura, we know there are a few other smaller sites that might have a one pair that we've added in the last two years, which is great. So in those cases, if you let me know that you specifically wanna to go to one of those spots, that's fine as well. And we will let you know if we have any spots that open up like that, which need monitoring from you as well. The areas that we need people the most as always were just Bluff and Long Beach, Milford Point and Sandy. And I'm sure that will remain the same based on birds and people. As mentioned, we're gonna do the same thing this year for data. So please submit all data through the electronic form in our blog at ctwaterbirds.blogspot.com. It is still right at the top online data submission form. If you go in and take a look, you'll be able to see all the fields that you need to fill out. They're basically the same as always, and it helps to Make sure that we get everything that we need from you and prompting you to enter that information. And it's so much easier for us on our end because we can go in and look at the database, not only now, but in the future and have very standardized, organized information that can be used consistently over years. Now, of course, you know, you can always email us as well. I'm primarily the contact point when you send an email to ctwaterbirds at gmail.com, but Corey will see it. Um, others may see it as well. And that way we can help you with any of the you know, the questions that come up through the year or noting things like string fencing and signage down more rapidly, any of the disturbances from um, other people and birds, and that way we can help you answer any questions as well. Um, there's other important documents there, like I mentioned right now, under the online data submission form, there's the 2022 monitoring program PDF that Laura put together. It is one large PDF with basically everything we need from that liability form to the monitoring program information, complete with dog information, being a good witness form and the um, volunteer time and activity record from deep. So definitely please take a look at that. And I'll be posting stuff in the blog and emailing everyone information as usual throughout the year. If you'd like to eBird um, other things as well, we always welcome that because we know so many of you are very active birders who are going out, whether it's to your local uh, hotspot and you see other shorebirds, turns and waders, those are the kind of lists that we'd like. If you have any travels in Connecticut, whether it's inland, coastal, and you see other shorebirds, turns and waders, it's always good to have that information. And it's good to see that people are noting the birds, going out and visiting them and doing other surveys. And it also even helps to know if you go out to say, a somewhat random beach on the coast that you're seeing, okay, maybe you saw these migrant shorebirds and you saw a 
some great egrets, but you didn't see any of our birds. So that helps too. So you can always share eBird data apart from your regular monitoring data by using the share function on eBird with ctwaterbirds at gmail.com. And if you have any other questions from bird ID, unknown sightings, monitoring, or anything we can help with, please email. Just ask that you please submit your data as soon as possible when you go monitoring. The faster we receive it, the more helpful and effective it'll be in doing our job and being able to deploy field staff to certain sites in need, being able to take care of problems as soon as they arise. And thank you so much for all of it. We appreciate it. And I know everyone will do a fantastic job again. This is the part about where we're gonna pick up our badges and lanyards this year. And, and also includes brochures if you'd like some of them to give out to folks. Stratford Point is at 1207 Prospect Drive in Stratford, Monday to Friday, nine to five. The Connecticut Audubon Coastal Center, Milford Point, which all of you know very well. And there's the various hours there you can stop by. The Roger Torrey Peterson Estuary Center, a great place to visit in Old Lyme. And you can also see us in a couple of weeks if you want to stop by. It's not necessarily for all of you because you're you're very experienced in returning monitors, but the new monitor volunteer training will be 10 to 12 on April 9th at Sandy Point in West Haven. But if you can't pick up anything at any of the spots and you're not able to get um, to one of them soon, you can let us know and Laura can mail a badge and uh, we can provide a form for you if you can't get to a particular spot. So just let us know. Thanks everybody. Okay, thank you, Scott. Um, so um, there are some birds that are banded in Connecticut, as you, you all know. Um, you know, we do have uh, Audubon, Connecticut has been actively banding American oyster catchers since uh, 2018, and we have 48 birds that are banded at this point. And um, we can definitely use your help reporting banded birds. Um, for oyster catchers, there's two, way, it's two ways to do it. You can actually, if you see an oyster catcher with a color band on it, um, you know, with uh, typically a letter and two numbers, you can report it directly to the American Oyster Catcher Working Group, um, which is amoywg.org. Um, and uh, if you submit a lot of reports, you'll actually have like a list of like my oyster catchers, and it'll tell you where each of those oyster catchers that you saw was originally banded and any information that's known about where it's been recited in the past. Um, or you can also just submit those reports, um, you know, when you submit your uh, data to, to Scott via the, um, the data form, you can just note that you saw banded oyster catchers there as well. Um, and that information will make its way to, to Beth, who is our, who sort of oversees our oyster catcher work. And uh, she'll make sure that those sightings get submitted to the oyster catcher working group. Um, so banding, you know, any information you guys can provide on, on where you are seeing oyster catchers with bands is really helpful to us. Um, you know, it, in the fall and in the spring, it tells us about where are their staging areas for oyster catchers. So for example, Milford Point um, and Minunkatesic Island are two known staging areas. So sometimes we'll see uh, either oyster catchers we banded or oyster catchers that breed further north of here. Um, using these staging areas in the spring and in the fall. Um, and, uh, you know, you guys reporting those bands just helps us to sort of identify those staging areas. Um, by in reporting banded birds, you also help us understand the sort of lifetime reproductive success and survival of these individuals. And uh, also by reporting bands, we're learning about breeding behavior. Um, we used to think that you know, a pair of oyster catchers like mated for life and they use the same site year after year after year. And I think a lot of them do do that, but we have definitely seen instances of, of sort of mate switching and, and sort of site switching. So um, those are, uh, it's another thing that we're learning from having um, banded birds here in Connecticut. If you wanna go to the next slide, Laura. Uh, there are also some piping plovers that are banded that show up in Connecticut. Um, pink flag 2E, which is uh, typically at Sandy Point, is a bird that we've been seeing for a number of years now. That's a bird that spends its winter in the Bahamas. Um, she typically shows up uh, pretty early in the season, um, nests early, and uh, by the end of June, she's headed back to the Bahamas again. Um, but that's a bird to keep an eye out for. Um, we do definitely have um, also see birds with green flags, and those are birds that were banded in Rhode Island. So if you um, see a banded piping plover, 
make note of where the bands are located. Um, they might be, you know, there will be a metal um, USGS band, um, but then there also could be various color bands. And the color bands can either be um, just regular circular bands or they can be flag bands, like the green band in the upper left photo. Um, so you want to know, is it on the left leg, on the right leg? Is it on the upper part of the leg or the lower part of the leg? Um, so it's if you see a banded plover, um, you know, take some good notes about where the bands are located. And that information, you really want it to go to Laura Saucier. So, um, you know, you can include it in your Audubon Alliance um, data sheets, but also make sure you email Laura Saucier directly as well um, and report that you saw a banded piping plover. Um, you know, we want to, you know, if you send that information to Laura, she'll track it down and figure out where that bird was originally banded. Um, and that definitely is, is really valuable information for us. So thank you. Okay. So um, if it's not one thing, it's another, right? So we seem to be past COVID a bit, even though I would still recommend people practice social distancing when they're out on the beach. But I wanted to take a quick minute to talk about um, the bird flu that you may have seen in the, uh, in the news as of late. I just wanted to give you a little bit of information about that. Um, so per the CDC, this strain of bird flu does, poses low risk to the public. So that's great. But wild birds can be infected and show no signs of illness. They, they're essentially carriers of the disease. And as they move about doing their normal migration and breeding um, activities, um, they are potentially exposing um, not only other wild birds to the flu, but also um, domestic poultry are quite susceptible to this form of flu. So um, I'd like to say, you know, avoid direct contact with wild birds and do not touch surfaces that may be contaminated with the saliva, mucus, or feces of wild birds. And um, practicing good biosecurity, as we've all, you know, had quite the crash course in biosecurity with, with COVID, um, you really, the biggest, the biggest issue with this is potentially us transferring the flu to any pet birds or poultry we may, ha we may have. So um, if you, I would suggest that you, after your monitoring shift, uh, change your clothes and shoes before interacting with domestic birds. For example, I have a flock of chickens, so the clothes and shoes that I'm using for monitoring, I'm just keeping at the office and I'm not bringing them home because I don't want to put my, my girls at risk to uh, catching flu. And it has, been, um, it has been found in wild birds in Connecticut, but um, there also have been a handful of situations where uh, flocks have been infected and had unfortunately had to have been euthanized. So um, it, is, it is a thing here in Connecticut. My computer is thinking. Give me a moment. Well, I'll just start talking and wait for my computer to catch up. Um, I just wanted to take a couple minutes to talk about being a good witness. Um, I'm not sure if if there's anyone from NCON on this session. Uh, if you can unmute and let us know that you're here. If not, I'll keep on talking about being a good witness. Okay, so. Uh, Again, most of you are seasoned veterans, um, so you you are quite familiar with um, what goes on at the beach. Um, so within the volunteer information packet that Scott mentioned that's up on the blog, there is, um, there is a incident form included in that packet. 
And um, I would really recommend that, you know, when you go out to do your monitoring, that you make sure that you either have the packet or have a copy of that form with you. And basically that form just helps you walk through um, the concept of being a good witness. So um, if you see a situation where people, a person is, you know, directly threatening piping plovers, they're throwing rocks at it, they're in the string fence, they're trying to stomp on chicks, um, you know, really egregious things. I'd really like you to um, write that down because that is a that is something that we would pass on to law enforcement. So um, if you see that, please call our NCON police, our Environmental Conservation Police, which is a uh, part of DEEP. The number is 860-424-3333, which you'll, that is also on your badge too. So you don't have to write that down, but um, we want you to call NCON and let them know what's going on. Obviously your safety is paramount. So um, if the person is really um, scary or whatnot, you know, you wanna get to a safe place before you call NCON. After you call NCON and let them know what's going on, who you are, where you are, what's going on, um, I'd like you to pull out your form and start taking notes. And it's basically going to be, um, you know, what are you seeing? What time of day is it? Where are you? What's going on? Um, description of the person. If you see that person walk to a car, a description of the car. Um, information on the, the weather, um, information on what that person may be saying. Um, if you can discreetly snap a picture, great, but do not put yourself in harm's way by uh, taking pictures and potentially angering that person. Um, all these things, everything that you write down will, will help NCON with um, potentially prosecuting the person should it get to that point. Um, I do have to say that, you know, I'm not law enforcement, you're not law enforcement. All we're doing is uh, supporting law enforcement through the, the notes we take and through letting them know when, um, when there's a problem. So also within your uh, volunteer packet is information on dog wardens. So NCON is um, if there are dog issues on state parks, NCON is the appropriate contact. If you are at a municipal beach and there are, you know, dogs chasing plovers, um, you definitely want to call NCON because those dogs are directly impacting those birds. But if it's just an issue of a dog roaming, um, you should call the local uh, dog warden um, because they have the authority for that property. So it's a bit squishy in that, um, you know, NCON has authority over the birds, but the towns have authority over town property and dogs in particular. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a gray area, but um, I encourage you to call the dog warden and let them know. They may not be able to respond, but certainly building a case as to, you know, I'm seeing the same person here every day at 10 o'clock, letting their dog off leash, the dogs chasing the birds, those sorts of things. Um, it builds kind of a, a case and helps that dog warden know when to um, kind of show up because obviously they're likely spread thin as well. So, um, so my computer's not advancing. So if anyone has any questions about being a good witness, certainly let me know. Um, most everything that I just went over is in that information packet. So you can review it again before you head out to the beach. So, all right. Does hey, Laura, there was a yes. question in the chat a little while ago that um, sort of relates to, to NCON and being mm -hmm. a witness. Um, but the question was, uh, if we find a, a dead uh, bird of, and it's one of the species that we're monitoring, what do we do? Okay, so also within that volunteer packet is a bit of a, um, it'll walk you through the scenarios in which, um, who you would call. So if, it, if someone finds a dead plover and there's no sign of vandalism, 
you didn't see anyone stomping on the bird. Um, it's just likely, or it looks like it died of natural causes, please call me. If it's a scenario where there's a dead bird, all the string fencing's ripped down, there's been a bonfire, um, the eggs are crushed, that sort of thing, that's a scenario where you would call NCON. And um, after you call NCON, if you can let me know, that would be great as well. Um, and please don't uh, collect the bird. Um, at that point, it ends up being a law enforcement situation where uh, we have to be sure we're not disturbing the, the crime scene, if you will. Um, and again, also, if, if the bird looks like it might have died of natural causes, don't collect the bird either. Um, that is my responsibility at the state. I have the proper permits and that sort of thing. So um, I'm really the entity that needs to be handling the bird. I don't know if anyone has any other questions. That was all I had to say, really. Yeah, so at this point, if we're, we're open for questions, um, you know, but uh, I will reiterate what Laura said at the beginning. You know, we want to thank you all for all the help you've given us over the last, you know, number of years. Like, um, you guys really are a valuable contributor to. Um, you know, our, our piping plover, oyster catcher, turn, monitoring and management. Um, and we thank you for all that you do. We're, we're so excited to see you all back again. So um, if anybody has questions, you know, feel free to unmute yourself and ask or go ahead and put them in the chat. I see that Tracy just asked, um, is there a direct link to the packet? Um, I'm about to send it right now. Okay, there we go. Perfect. And if you ever need any of this information in general, mm -hmm. you can just go right to the blog, ctwaterbirds.blogspot.com, and everything is in the right-hand corner, including the data entry and this packet, the top right. But I'll place the link, the direct PDF link to the chat, in the chat right now. What did I just say? What did you say? Hi, uh, Scott, Laura. Um, what can you do about the predators at Long Beach, the rats and the weasels? I don't, I don't know if you time. want to say something, Corey. Um, so we are working with the town on that. So we are, we are, you know, that is something the town is, is actually, you know, um, it wants to do something about it. And um, we are, I know that they are in the process of trying to figure out the most, the best approach. Um, you know, predator management is not easy. Um, you know, it, it is, you do really need to think through it carefully. Um, you know, you obviously want to deal with the predators, um, but you want to make sure you're not impacting other species in the process. So, but it is something that um, they are looking into and are, are hoping to do something about in the, the near future. And also the drones, aren't they illegal over parkland and stuff? So uh, yes and no. Um, on municipal properties, they're essentially it needs to be regulated. So um, I know uh, I believe Audubon Connecticut is working with Westport about uh, trying to help them craft some uh, regulations to eliminate uh, to stop people flying drones over um, over breeding birds. Um, there's also we also had that issue at Westport. Um, so we need to work with them as well. There are some, there are rules on state parks with regards to drones. It has more to do with um, respecting people's privacy and people not being harassed by drones more so than birds, but um, I'll, I'll take whatever I can get with regards to um, drones being regulated at state parks. Uh, let's see. Tracy, I saw your question about drones at Bluff Point. Probably, um, because it is so close to the airport, I would, they shouldn't, I, I think the FAA gets involved in, um, 
in that scenario. I think Scott, you know more about it. Yeah, I was gonna say as I sit in front of a background that is a drone picture. Um, <laughs> for the most part, we have our beaches located near our airports on the coast, and it just kind of coincidentally stops a lot of what should be disturbing our birds because it's against uh, the law to fly a drone usually within five miles of the airport um, in a lot of cases, but that varies at different times and different permissions. And thankfully, yes, because we're close to the airport there, and for example, I'll use an easy one, um, Short Beach in Stratford is quite literally right at the end of the runway um, for the airport here. And we've had a couple cases where people were flying drones and, you know, you report it to the police and even they're like, oh, well, gee, I don't know. Is that permissible or not? And people don't often even know within law enforcement, but if you let them know, you know, what's going on and, and what the federal guidelines are. And then you let, um, in, in some cases, you know, I've called the airport directly in the tower and then let them know and their security or others can contact the police and tell them. And that's helped a lot too. So for the most part, I think we're okay. Um, you know, Laura mentioned the, the parks and, you know, different private properties now, and you see more um, conservation areas taking the mindset of, we're not going to have or permit drones here. We have a land trust, it's a private property, and we decided we're just not going to do it. Um, so for the most part, it's, it's pretty well regulated now. It's just something that for, you know, just like, Everything else we just have to kind of keep an eye on and, and deal with ourselves as it comes up. I saw a question from Tom about uh, the dead birds. Uh, so um, he asked if last year the, the dead terns are found, um, is there an interest in the carcass? And if so, what should be done? Um, yes, uh, I'm still kind of working on that with regards so not only uh, turns, but also trying to, um, you know, bird flu can also be spread like the scavenging, scavenging birds, bald eagles, vultures and whatnot are getting hit hard by bird flu because they are scavenging on these birds that um, are carriers. If, if they die quick, they die and they're scavenged upon quickly. There is a high probability that that scavenger will catch bird flu. So we have kind of an, an additional um, incentive to perhaps collect these birds, but I haven't, I haven't worked my way through it yet. I'm, I'm working with um, the, the folks in my agency, um, Department of Ag and uh, the rehabber folks trying to come up with a game plan for that. So I will keep you posted. So, but if you do see dead bird, um, maybe just let us know so that if, you know, Rebecca's in the area or I'm in the area, we can collect it. But sorry, no, no concrete answer right now, but I will keep you posted. I had, a, I had a, if, while people are thinking, I had an interesting, um, quick video that I wanted to, to show folks since we have a little bit of time, just because it's interesting. Um, let me see if I can actually get it to work given that my computer has been thinking an awful lot. Um, but it is some footage that some folks that uh, I work with in a different, different state um, had of a least turn colony being least turn colony that is um, reacting to a fireworks display and it was it was pretty fascinating so let me see if I can get this to work all right
Yeah. Maybe it won't work. Arg, it's not working. Oh, well, okay. My computer is quite cranky today. A poor day for that to be the case, but oh well. I'll have to show it to you maybe at the uh, at the end of season uh, end of season get together because it was it was really interesting to see. I'd never seen you know we when we are at fireworks displays we hear the birds you know they're calling we know what's going on but because we're you know we can't see in the dark we don't get the full picture and and this um, this video is pretty pretty interesting in that the birds really were worked up, um, flying around, calling, that sort of thing. Like what we, ex what we expect um, for turns for sure. So anyhow, did anyone have any more questions? Yeah, I know that Frank has a question about reporting banded oyster catchers on the working group uh, website and uh, Frank, I'm looking into it right now. <laughs> I will share that. Uh, my name is Tracy. I will share that when I was at Bluff Point last year, um, someone came and uh, parked their boat right off the, the beach, off, uh, Bushy Point and then proceeded to swim ashore with their dog and let their dog run up and down the beach chasing birds. And in that situation, had it gone worse then I would obviously have called NCON, um, but I was able to talk to the woman, she had no clue. Oh, he just does that, they, that's what he likes to do. I said, yes, but that's why I'm here to keep this, you know, and had the whole discussion and, and told her that dogs were allowed on the, on the paths in the woods but not on the beach. And she was very thankful, but really the public has no idea. And she and the sign does not face out to the water where it says no dogs. So there was nothing I could point to to her for that. So um, that was just something that I came across. I thought I'd share. Um, it turned out fine. It could have gotten ugly, but she was very pleasant and just had no idea. <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you for doing that. And um, yeah, that's a good point. Boating is sometimes we, we focus a lot of our efforts on the people that are walking the beach and not necessarily people that are showing up via boat. Um, and Audubon, Connecticut is definitely working on that um, by doing some outreach with uh, the boating community and potentially some of the fishing community um, in the near future. So we're trying to, to get at that boating as aspect because it is problematic at Bluff Point for sure, at Ham and Asset for sure. Um, so, but thanks again for your efforts. That's great. It's, I'm so happy to hear it went well. Me too. Um, Corey, I just uh, like to thank everyone for being here and for the time and effort that you put into helping us monitor the shorebirds. Um, I'm going to put a notice in the chat about a beach cleanup at Griswold Point and a work uh, string fencing work party at Griswold Point. We do have a capacity limit, uh, both for staff and volunteer safety during COVID, but also as the shorebirds are returning, we want to um, obviously have a minimal impact. Um, but if you have questions, my email is in the, um, in the chat as well. Thank you. I see you, you have your hand raised. Did you have a chance to ask your question? 
Yes, no. Um, my name is Donna Hansen, and when I've gone over to uh, Long Beach, you know, there's a pathway going all the way over to uh, Pleasure Beach, and people do walk along where they're supposed to walk, and they do. But do you think that is a component of why we're seeing less successive nests over there with um, not just the piping plovers, but the terns at Long Beach? I see Laura's thinking, give her Long a, Beach, a second I'll just say, Long answer. Beach is very complex. Long Beach has a lot of problems that come in on our birds. Um, Long Beach has recently, Laura really highlighted the predation, the rats and all that. Um, in the past, it was fox. And we have kiteboarding. We have sometimes fireworks. We have people aimlessly wandering into nesting areas. We used to have people who were basically living out there, digging holes and, and just there all the time. It is one of the most busy, heavily trafficked areas uh, that we have. And it's just everything and everyone all the time. Uh, we added more drones and photographers now, and it's, it's kind of an uphill battle always. Um, we had a lot of success there for a few years when we had a bunch of birds nesting and we were, we were able to kind of balance it out a little. It helps if you have Sometimes it actually helps if you have people there because they can they would keep some of the some of the predators away, but not leave too much trash for other predators. But it's a careful balancing act. And I know Corey and, and Audubon, Connecticut, and others are working really hard with the town of Stratford right now on some of the major issues. And you know, we mentioned more of the predation stuff. So we're, we're working on it, but there are always people on that path. And that's why it's so vital to, you know, have all of you, and we're so grateful to have all of you because you go out there and, and talk to these folks and can let them know what's going on you know there's a lot of signs and there's a lot of there's a lot of signs people drive by and a lot of signs people disregard for their dogs or otherwise too but you know the more of us out there talking about this and engaging on this the better can i can i add to that um since since i'm one of the people that help monitor the plovers there and turns i think Part of the problem is there's so much disturbance because it's it's a, it's such a narrow barrier beach, and you know, like the woman said, the path down the middle, um, birds are constantly getting disturbed by just walkers. You know, people that are staying outside the fence and everything. But every time somebody walks by, the turns fly up. I mean, the plovers aren't bothered so much because uh, they're in there exclosure or whatever they sit tight on the nest but certainly the turns suffer a lot of disturbance just by any all the people that just walk by yeah i'll add to that too i, I agree with you frank um once that path was established i don't know it's been 10 years or so i think that that path was established it's nice in that it keeps people kind of to a central path, but at the same time, it does bisect habitat. So it's double-edged sword. Um, but yeah, turns are definitely gonna be more susceptible to that disturbance on both sides because you have people walking, you know, along the water and then you have people walking, you know, in the in the middle of the habitat. So they're definitely gonna be they're more sensitive to that. One thing um, that we're doing at Long Beach this summer, just sort of, um, you know, kind of maybe help with that issue is, um, so Audubon Connecticut, Connecticut Audubon Society and the town and DEP have been involved as well. We're gonna be sort of piloting a strategy to sort of try to change human behavior. Um, and, uh, you know, really we're gonna be focusing on the tide. So um, there's gonna be some signs that sort of indicate like, you know, if it's, if it's high tide, you know, like birds need more space because they're, you know, they're roosting and they have a limited area, um, you know, and that, uh, and then if it's, if it's low tide and there's more space, you know, there's a little bit more space for people too. So I, you know, I think we're going to be, you know, there's going to be, um, you know, some signs that kind of indicate to people like, you know, if it's high tide, you know, just stick to the path. Don't walk like down on the shoreline just so that we have maybe disturbance from people just on the path, and not necessarily down on the water's edge. Um, you know, if it's low tide, you know, then there's, and there's ample space, you know, down on the water's edge, then people can use the path or walk on the water's edge. Um, but just trying to, you know, get people to give the birds a bit more space, um, you know, even during, 
when birds are foraging down on the water's edge, you know, we're going to have some, some temporary signs that will occasionally be put up that sort of say, hey, the birds are foraging, um, you know, especially when there's large numbers of shorebirds that are sort of migrating through in the spring, spring and the fall, and just ask people to give those birds additional space. So, um, so there'll be uh, some tabling events, both at Long Beach and at Milford Point um, over the course uh, during the sort of May 15th to August 15th period. So uh, keep an eye out for those and, uh, you know, uh, feel free to stop by and say hello and, and sort of look at, see some of these new resources that will be available. Okay, well, um, if there isn't any more questions, I just want to thank everybody for for tuning in this morning, and um, you know, thank you for all your your continuing continuing help, um, sort of stewarding our beach nests and birds, and uh, we'll see you out on the shoreline and look forward to, to getting your reports. So, thank you very much. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks. Bye.